Thank you everyone for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Brandon McNeil. I'm the technical sales and marketing lead here at Aquanti. Uh, I think I've been in contact with almost everyone here, but if anybody has any follow up questions about Hydro Geosphere or Aquanti following today's webinar, feel free to reach out to me anytime. My email is bmcneil at aquanti.com. Um, so again, thanks for joining us in today's webinar. We'll be discussing Hydro Geosphere research applications focused on saltwater intrusion and geothermal energy transport. Um, Aquanti is a water resources science and technology firm specializing in integrated hydrologic computer modeling software and services across a broad base of industrial sectors. The company is a research spinoff company from the University of Waterloo and was founded by the key developers of Hydro Geosphere, which is of course the core of the, the modeling involved in all of today's presentations. Hydro Geosphere is a class leader in fully integrated three-dimensional surface and subsurface hydrologic modeling. And simply put, it's the world's most powerful simulation platform for integrated hydrologic systems. HGS dynamically integrates key components of the hydrologic cycle and can incorporate land surface processes such as evaporate, evaporation from bare soil, transpiration involving uh, vegetation, unsaturated flow, flow, flow in the porous and or discrete fractured media. Um, in addition, Hydrogeosphere fully supports reactive solute transport, thermal energy transport, and density dependent flow in all model domains. These are important features, as you'll see from today's presentations. Now, we, we recently attended the ModFlow and More conference in Princeton, New Jersey, and we were really happy to see Hydrogeosphere so well represented throughout the week's presentations. There were researchers from a few different universities there discussing their latest research using HG, HGS for saltwater intrusion and geothermal energy transport modeling. We were so impressed that we wanted to uh, give these researchers an opportunity to present their work to the wider Aquanti network, which is what brings us together here today for the webinar. We really hope that the webinar will lead to further partnerships with water resources experts around the world. Um, if there's anything here that really interests any attendees, or if you have any ideas or projects of your own that we at Aquanti can help with, or you might use Hydro Geosphere for, uh, we definitely encourage you to connect with us. Feel free to email me directly or email info at Aquanti.com, and we'll be sure to put you in touch with the right people. All right, so without any further delays, um, let's get to our first presenter. Dr. Anair Palder. Anair has a master's and PhD in hydrology and water resources science from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he studied hydrogeological mechanisms for deep submarine groundwater discharge and offshore fresh groundwater through a case study in northern Israel. After his PhD, he took a postdoctoral research position with the Michael Hydrogeology Group at the University of Delaware, where he works to this day as an associate scientist. Anair's specific research topics include coastal processes, the impact of extreme weather events, groundwater surface water interactions, submarine groundwater discharge, and offshore fresh groundwater. Today, Anair will be presenting some of his latest research in investigating the impact of high and low frequency fluctuations in sea level and their impact on the modeled salinity of coastal aquifers. Anair, please feel free to take the screen and uh, take it away. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Braden, for the introduction. Uh, I wasn't aware I did so many things, but <laughs> thanks. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, as Braden said, I will be presenting um, my, pro my latest project. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, Holly Michael, who's the PAI in our group, and also Ryan Fredericks, who is a graduate student. You will be hearing Ryan Fredericks. Uh, right after me, he's actually in the room with me, so um, he will be presenting his cool research too. And this uh, specific project is about saltwater intrusion in a more broader context, looking at different uh, scales of sea level fluctuations and uh, how these uh, sea level forcings impact coastal aquifers and the salinity in coastal aquifers. So the idea is to look at the broad uh, range of time scales over which sea level fluctuations occur. So starting with waves that occur over seconds, tides, uh, diurnal time scales, seasonalities, which represent uh, annual changes in the hydrologic regime, um, moving up to uh, repetitive storm surges that occur on cable time scales, all the way up to 
glacial uh, cycles or fluctuate glacial uh, fluctuations in sea level, which are millennial scales. And really the overarching question of this project was how do these uh, multi-scale fluctuations impact uh, the salinity distribution in coastal aquifers? So uh, to study that or to address this question, we uh, obviously use hydrojuice here. That's why we're here. And as Brayden mentioned, hydrojuice here couples surface and subsurface flow and also includes solute transport, in this case, the solute is salt, which also induces uh, variable density flow. And all of these components are crucial components in modeling coastal hydrogeological uh, settings, especially when you consider the interactions between surface water and groundwater or sea level fluctuations. And just to show you the competence of hydrogeosphere, uh, this is a surge simulation. So the surface domain, you'll, uh, when, when I run the video, you'll see the surface domain inundating uh, and retreating. And the subsurface, the porous medium media is uh, colored with salinity. So red is seawater salinity, blue is uh, freshwater. Pre-surge or steady state uh, interface are typically tilted or inclined as you see here. But when we start uh, the surge, and let me quickly change the laser to be able to pointer. So this is how the simulation looks like, the inundation and the retreat. And really, uh, the important thing to notice here is that the subsurface uh, salinizes from the top due to the infiltration of the inundation waters. And this pattern follows the topography, again, showing uh, the competence of hydrogeosphere. You don't have to explicitly consider topography in your boundary condition. It just inundates the surface, calculates the surface flow dynamics, and accordingly, the uh, coupling with the subsurface and the solid transport. Uh, provides an opportunity to simulate um, aquifer salinization due to changes in sea level. So thinking about these uh, multi-scale fluctuations in sea level, what we wanted to do in this project is to simulate three of these processes that I mentioned previously. So tides and storms and uh, glacial cycles, glacial fluctuations in sea level. And we uh, used a 2D domain um, because in this case, we were not interested in the alongshore variability um, and how the model looks like is something like this. Specific model dimensions, lengths, and uh, heights or depths uh, vary between processes because obviously for um, different amplitudes of sea level fluctuations, you need different sizes of, sizes, uh, of domains to accommodate the fluctuations. But the boundary conditions are pretty typical in coastal hydrogeological modeling. We had from the land side, which is the right hand side here, the blue dots, uh, constant flux of fresh water. So C equals zero is fresh water. And on the sea side, we applied a boundary condition only on the leftmost or on the sea side surface node. Again, showing you how. Uh, Hydrogeosphere facilitates these types of simulations because you don't have to explicitly simulate on all of the top nodes different uh, boundary conditions throughout the fluctuations. So applying a constant head, um, uh, a prescribed head on this node with seawater salinity ensures inundation or sea level rise or retreat based on this H naught T. And for the steady state simulations, this was held constant at zero a calm condition sea level or still water sea level. But for the tides, we applied a time series that looked look like this. So fluctuating from uh, between minus one and one around that mean sea level uh, over a journal scale. So this is um, daily time periods over 100 years. The repetitive surges looked, uh, the boundary time series for the boundary condition looked like this. So every 10 years, we applied a two and a half meter surge, we simulated uh, a total of 160 years. And finally, for the glacial cycles, we simulated a 40 meter amplitude with a period of 100,000 years. And I plotted here in the black dashed line also the um, actual reconstructed paleo sea levels to show that this is uh, roughly in good agreement with the actual sea level, uh, past sea level fluctuations. Um, the red is what we simulated. So jumping right to the results, this is 
this plot is uh, the black curve is the total normalized salt mass in the aquifer. So a value of one is the steady state or the calm conditions. And the blue curve here is the uh, boundary condition, which I just uh, mentioned in the previous slide. This blue rectangle here may be confusing. It's just because that seesaw pattern of tidal fluctuations when it's condensed for 100 years, it looks like a blue rectangle, but it's uh, exactly the same. And what we see here when we look at the black curve is that when we apply these tidal fluctuations or tidal sea level changes, we see a long-term change in the average salinity such that it stabilizes after about 50 years on a salt mass that is 60, more or less 60% higher than what we have considering steady state or ignoring fluctuations uh, in sea level. And when we look at the final time step when the sea level is back at its initial uh, level, this is how the transition uh, zone looks like. So 0.1 uh, seawater salinity and 0.9 uh, seawater salinity contours represent the mixing zone. And the black mixing zone is the initial, um, what we had when we started the fluctuations, the blue is at this uh, time after 100 years. And we see that the mixing zone shifts inland and widens uh, under these uh, simulated tides. How does this look when we simulate repetitive surges, so the decadal scale fluctuations in sea level? Again, the blue curve is that boundary condition, two and a half meter surges over 160 years. And the black curve, the total salt mass, we see these patterns following uh, each surge we have a rapid increase in salinity or in the total salt stored in the aquifer, followed by a period of recovery, but the aquifer does not recover uh, fast enough and the following surge elevates or brings this total salinity to even higher levels. And again, we have the long-term shift in the average salinity to uh, values of about 50% higher over the course of this uh, 160 simulated years. And again, looking at the mixing zone, the sea level is back at its still water level. We see some something uh, quite similar to the tides. The 0.9 salinity contour is co-located. That doesn't move. But the 0.1 salinity contour moves inland and widens uh, from the top. And this is due to the repetitive addition of salt from the top with these uh, surges that inundate the surface. And again, I labeled this, I didn't mention in the previous, this is a persistent effect. It, it's more or less stable on this state. Moving on to uh, the lowest frequency or the highest period of fluctuations, we see here that uh, the changes in the total salt in the aquifer are in phase with the boundary condition. The blue curve and the black curve are in phase, meaning that there is no long-term impact of sea level fluctuations for this um, cycle, um, glacial cycles, but we do see that the peaks here are above the value of one. So we see that added salt um, is hot, reaches higher values of total salt compared with the initial state, or what we simulate without um, glacial cycles. And when we look at the mixing zone at this time, when the sea level it added, is at its peak, we see that the transition zone is somewhat wider and further inland compared to the initial zone. Again, the blue is at this time with black circle and the black is the initial mixing zone. And this is related to an overshoot effect. When the sea level rises and stops here, the subsurface transition zone still progresses inland. This is a, uh, this is a phenomenon that's been shown both in numerical simulations and in physical experiments. Uh, previously, so this is something physical, not related to a numerical instability or something, but this is a temporary effect, important to consider because this can induce discrepancies between uh, observed and simulated uh, salinities when you do not consider the fact that glacial cycles may have an impact, an episodic impact on the distribution of salinities, um, even if this uh, is not persistent, even if uh, only temporary. And with that in mind, we wanted to see how aquifer storage properties impact the long-term salinity or the dynamic steady state. So in hydrogeosphere, the way to directly control storage properties is through the specific storage. Uh, values of specific storage 
of 10 to the minus 1 are not necessarily natural, but again, we wanted to uh, isolate the effect of storage properties and remove and not change the uh, transport solution or the porosity. So that's why we changed the specific storage. But the thing to bear in mind here is that when we look at the processes that have a long-term average salinity, storage properties actually do control the long-term or the average salinities, which is something that um, hydrogeologists tend to uh, ignore. We, as coastal hydrogeologists, tend to ignore since storativity is a term that falls from steady state equations. But considering dynamic steady states, this is an important factor. And to generalize this, we came up with this equation relating between hydraulic diffusivity or aquifer properties and the period of the uh, cyclical forcing. And put in words, which is maybe more simple, which may be easier to digest, um, whether or not you have a long-term shift in the salinity with the cyclical process depends on the aquifer properties, its storativity and hydraulic conductivity, but also on the uh, period of the forcing. So I showed you that glacial cycles do not have a long-term impact. For different systems, they may have a long, uh, longer-term impact on the average salinities. And conversely, the tides that we showed that shift the average salinity by 60% may not have this effect for uh, aquifers with different hydraulic diffusivities. So to wrap this up, um, I showed you that average salinities are controlled by high frequency processes such as tides and repetitive surges and low frequency forcing such as uh, glacial cycles have uh, may induce these episodic discrepancies um, with and without considering the sea level fluctuations. And finally, the last thing I showed you is that with that in mind, storativity uh, properties of the aquifer should be considered uh, for average salinities, even though they fall off uh, the equation for steady state uh, simulations. So with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions or thoughts, whether on, on the modeling or on the scientific side, feel free to reach out. And if you want to download the paper, we've also included a link here. Uh, so thanks. Thank you very much, Anair. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Oh, actually, I saw one just come in, actually, from Britt. Um, so Britt asks, um, I found the similarities between the cyclical effects on overall salinity distributions. Um, she says it sounds remarkably similar to those in surface estuaries. Surface estuaries show on faster time scales with well mixed conditions during the rising water levels and vertically stratified during falling water levels. Do you see something similar? So, first of all, hey, Britt. <laughs> Good to. Um, so, do you mean observed in terms of in the model itself or in field observations? Because I think, and Brayden can correct me if I'm wrong, but hydrogeosphere, we, we don't focus on the surface salinity structure or the variability. Um, or are you talking about the subsurface salinity and estuaries? I was talking about the subsurface salinity. So in surface, just the similarities to the surface estuaries and how that leads to increased salt in the estuary um, seemed really similar to what you're seeing and what the surface estuary guys see is as the tide or the surge or the sea level comes in, it's pretty well mixed in salinity that water mixes quickly and it's bringing a lot of salt in. But as it drains, partly because of the fresh water from inland, you have fresh water at the surface and salt water at the bottom. So it drains more fresh than salt, which leads to a progressive salinization. And I was curious if the increased salinization you see in a subsurface aquifer is a really similar process with that. They call it tidal straining, where it's really well mixed going in and then it's stratified as the water flows out. And if that's part of what's leading to that increased salinization in the aquifer. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So to be honest, I'm, I'm not really sure surface salinity dynamic dimension, uh, tidal restraining, I'm not sure what you call it, but um, I can see this being a similar process, again, because of the buoyancy effect, because of the variable density, where you have that 
recovery fresh water is basically flushing out either the surface of the estuary or the subsurface in the aquifer and that flushing out is more favorable i guess to the upper parts where the inundation may be somewhat different um I, i'm not really sure about the similarities between the surface domain but I, I, that that could be something interesting to look at i, I haven't thought about it honestly understood Th thank you i was thank you that's perfect Sounds like a great topic for a follow-up discussion. Um, <laughs> we've got another quick question from Ed Siddiqui in the chat. He's just asked uh, what kind of longitudinal and transverse dispersivities you used for your models. Yeah, so the dispersivities for the subsurface domain, if I'm not mistaken, were 20 meters and 10, and sorry, 20 and two, uh, longitudinal and transverse. For the surface domain, I think we had to increase them a bit because the surface domain with salinity um you can get numerical instabilities pretty easily uh and we were as i told Britt, the surface salinity dynamics were not something that we were extremely concerned about we were more interested in the coupling between the surface and the subsurface but for the subsurface we used 20 and 2. excellent well thank you very much anair yeah. um I think we'll leave it at that for questions uh, on anair's presentation but of course you know Feel, feel free to follow up with an air uh, anytime. So next up, we have a presentation by Ryan Fredericks. Ryan has a master's degree in hydrogeology from the University at Buffalo and is currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Delaware, also with the Michael Hydro Hydrogeology Group. Ryan is researching threats to coastal groundwater resources, including sea level rise and storm surge inundation using a combination of fieldwork, time series analysis, and groundwater flow and transport modeling. Uh, Ryan, feel free to steal the screen from me and take it away. Great. Um, OK, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, groundwater vulnerability to both sea level rise and storm surge salinization. And uh, this work has been focused on Astigue Island in Maryland. Um, and I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, um, an air and an air Paldor and Holly Michael who have contributed to this work. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background motivation. So we know that climate change is going to cause both sea level rise and storm surge intensification. So looking at the uh, figure on the lower left, you can see the relative sea level rise for the entire uh, North American continent. And what we can see is that there's a pretty significant sea level rise in the Gulf and along the mid-Atlantic of the U.S. Um, and then similarly, we're going to get some storm surge intensification. So the figure on the right shows the change in the 100-year uh, return level um, due to increasing frequency and intense intensity of um, tropical storms. So again, we see a pretty substantial increase in the vulnerability of the, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but we also see a pretty high vulnerability to changes in storm surge um, along the mid-Atlantic of the U.S., uh, kind of on the order of, you know, about two meter change in the 100 year return level. Um, and so it's important to really understand how this is going to impact coastal groundwater because a lot of people depend on groundwater um, uh, for the you know for their primary drinking water source as well as many ecosystems are kind of dependent on this groundwater um, and the the relative influence of these two processes to um, coastal groundwater salinization has been relatively understudied um, so to give a little bit of background about our field site so Astigue Island is a barrier island um, along the coast of Maryland you can see kind of from this picture here on the Delmarva um, and we've instrumented it with a transect of seven wells um, so the so the picture on the right is showing uh, our well nest, and this is looking um, west towards the mainland. So the mainland is kind of off in the distance there. Um, and so using uh, these well, the well data that we have, as well as um, some precipitation data from a NOAA gauge at the airport kind of across the bay, as well as a NOAA tide gauge at Ocean City, and then kind of off um, to, on the right of this figure, there's also a NOAA buoy that gives us uh, the significant wave height. Um, but we're using that to try to understand the, the interplay between sea level rise and storm surge inundation on groundwater salinity. Uh, so using these data, we kind of, we built a hydrogeosphere model. Um, and so basically it's a transect that goes through all of our wellness. Um, and so 
this figure on the bottom right is showing the um, aquifer layer. So we've got basically mostly sand and uh, lagoonal mud. Um, and then we here are our three well nests kind of in the upper portion of the aquifer um, using, and then uh, for the boundary conditions, we have precipitation, uh, which is um, applied basically across the island. Um, and that's shown in this upper figure in the black bars here. So we have some precipitation events, uh, one really big one um, in mid-October. And then on the left-hand side, uh, we apply a variable head boundary um, and constant concentration that is uh, seawater salinity. And that is um, governed by the tide gauge um, that I showed from Ocean City. And that's in this dark blue curve here. And then on the ocean side, we use the tide gauge plus the uh, uh, run-up estimate um, based on the measured significant wave height um, in the light blue here. And so um, using these boundary conditions, we calibrate a model. Um, and so this is kind of what the calibration looks like. So on the upper panel, I'm showing the head uh, and two wells. So these are the two shallow wells from the well nest closest to the ocean and the middle well nest here. Um, so top row is the head and the bottom row is the specific conductance. Um, and then the blue is the measurement and the red curve is the model. So basically what you can see is you have a fairly good match, um, at least uh, for the trend in the heads, uh, we slightly under predict in the beginning and maybe a little over prediction um, after the surge. Um, and then similarly on the specific conductance, uh, specific conductance is maybe not quite as uh, well calibrated, um, but on the, in the area closest to the ocean, we're basically not capturing all of the flushing and uh, resalinization that we get there, but we do get the timing of the uh, salinization events. And then um, on the second well nest, the middle well nest, we're seeing a much better uh, resolution of the actual salinity. Um, and so I think part of the reason why our specific conductance is a little off is because we're using a run up estimate. Um, so uh, as our boundary condition, and so with the run up, uh, you know, only a, a few ways would actually meet that run up height that we're applying as our boundary condition. And so we're kind of over predicting the um, amount of time that you're getting salt water um, into the system. So using this calibrated model, um, Basically, I wanted to investigate uh, a couple of different scenarios to understand how sea level rise and um, storm surge intensification is going to impact the um, uh, sound, uh, the salinity of the groundwater. Um, and so, I basically have three model scenarios that I ran. Uh, one of which is a sea level rise, um, and so this is 80 years of sea level rise using the RCP 8.5. So that's the most um, severe uh, business as usual uh, climate change scenario. And then the second scenario is a current and future uh, storm surge uh, scenario. So again, the future is going to be RCP 8.5. And then the third model scenario that we're going to talk about is uh, a couple of different types of hydrogeologic systems to try to generalize um, our results from ASTI to other systems. So starting with the uh, Sea level rise. Um, so what I'm showing on the left here is the steady state salinity conditions. Um, and so the blue is uh, fresh water and the red is going to be 100% uh, seawater. So we can see basically there's a small, a sizable freshwater lens on the island, basically on the order of five meters depth. Um, and then after 80 years of sea level rise, uh, the freshwater lens is substantially thinned, maybe only about a meter to two meters. Um, and then moving on to the storm surge events. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the current storm surge. So this is just a video. There's going to be basically 10 repetitive surges uh, through this video. And what you see is that basically the current two-year storm event doesn't really salinize much of the aquifer. You mostly just get um, some basically salinization on the beach face, but it doesn't actually uh, fully inundate the whole aquifer. On the other hand, uh, if we look at future two-year storm events, so this is projected out in 2080. Um, and again, there's going to be, hold on, there we go. 
uh, there's going to be 10 of these events in a row. Um, you get uh, the future tier event is expected to fully overtop the aquifer, and um, it will lead to gradually building salinity until eventually the aquifer is fully salinized. And so if we just skip ahead to the end of that simulation, um, you can see by the end of this basically 30 year period of uh, um, consistently um, getting a storm every two years, you, you see a basically fully salinized aquifer. Um, so then to take a look at this kind of from a more quantitative standpoint, here's the total mass, uh, showing the total mass of salt in the system over 80 years, um, and the total volume salinized over 80 years. So we can see um, on the left-hand figure, so the the blue sea level rise, and so we'll get about, you know, starting in the 3850 kilograms of salt in the system. Um, by the end of the sea level rise, we'll have about 4100. Um, on the other hand, the present day two year storm event doesn't really salinize much of the aquifer, so you really see basically minimal change in the total mass in the aquifer. But on the other hand, the future two year storm events are going to salinize a much more significant portion of the aquifer than sea level rise. And then looking at the volume, uh, again, the volume salinized by the present two year storm event is really not going to salinize too much of the aquifer. Sea level rise will salinize a pretty good volume of the aquifer, um, but the uh, future two year storm event will fully salinize the whole aquifer, basically. Okay, um, then uh, I tried, wanted to try to generalize this to more systems aside from just acetique. So uh, when we think about sea level rise vulnerability, there are kind of two different systems um, that we can classify uh, coastlines into, and those are recharge limited and topography limited. So for a recharge limited system, there's a pretty substantial unsaturated zone, um, whereas for a topography limited system, there's minimal unsaturated zone. Um, and so these behave differently when you have sea level rise. Um, for the recharge limited system, the inland groundwater table can rise and it kind of prevents um, uh, infiltration of saline groundwater. But on the other hand, when you have a topography limit system, there is not an unsaturated zone to allow for the rising water table and you get much more severe seawater intrusion. And so um, using the ASTIG model, um, I try to induce a topography limit system in two different ways, uh, one of which is by reducing the elevation of the top layer, and the other is by lowering the hydraulic conductivity. And so what we can see, again, um, this is now showing the mass of salt in the system and the volume of the system that's salinized over 80 years. So uh, when we reduce the surface elevation to create topography limit system, the um, sea level rise catches up to the change in storm surge uh, salinization, which you can see here. So basically, it's sea level rise uh, uh, meets uh, with uh, the changes in storm surge from, or the changes in salinity from the storm surge. Um, and similarly, the sea, sea level rise will salinize the whole aquifer just as the changes in uh, the two-year storm event will as well. Um, on the other hand, when we reduce the conductivity to create a topography limited system, um, you can see that the sea level rise actually does not uh, catch up with changes to the um, storm surge uh, return levels, basically. So um, just to kind of wrap up, um, overall sea level rise is less impactful uh, than storm surge intensification um, and different types of systems um, differ quite a bit in their vulnerability. So topography limit systems that are created by really low surface elevation, we have uh, sea level rise is comparable to storm surge overwash changes, uh, while topography limited systems that are uh, limited by their conductivity, um, the storm surge intensification is much more impactful than sea level rise. And yeah, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, so there were a couple of additional questions, I think, for Anair, but we can circle back to those after the, the other presentations. 
Um, looks like there is one question that came in for you though, Ryan. Storm surge and sea level rise are happening simultaneously in nature. Did you look at the combined the combined effects of these two stresses? Um, so I have not in this uh, work, but I am planning to do that. Um, I think that basically the idea here was to try to disentangle the two so that we can understand um, if the, you know, which, which is kind of to protect against uh, sea level rise um, would require um, either, you know, uh, pumping out or creating a hydraulic barrier. And so that uh, could actually make the storm surge and um, make, you know, storm surge salinization worse if you if you're pumping from your aquifer and you're lowering the water table um, to try to remove salt water from sea level rise and then you get an overwash event you could actually uh, drive basically more salinization from that um, so that was kind of the idea of disentangling them but i do think it would be interesting to take a look at how both of those uh, interact together um i have one more question if you allow of course, go ahead. Yeah, uh, about the hydrogeosphere model, does it simulate the groundwater recharge based on the precipitation amount that we apply, or we need to we can apply the uh, recharge amount? Uh, Sorry, can you repeat that? So, for the groundwater recharge, um, so does the model simulate or estimate the groundwater recharge based on the precipitation, precipitation amount that we apply, or we directly apply the recharge? Um, yeah, so so in my model, I, I directly applied recharge. Well, in the calibration, I um, it's based on the precipitation and ET, but in the in the actual scenarios, I just applied an average recharge um, for the year. And I'll just say in general, you can take both approaches with hydrogeosphere. Um, typically, if you're doing a fully integrated model, you know, the, the amount of groundwater recharge is going to be dictated by the flow solution. So the amount of precipitation that you're applying or whether there's any standing surface water, for example, in the case of a you know, a storm surge that would be applied as a, you know, typically a boundary condition in the surface domain. Um, but it is also possible to just apply a specified recharge as a flux directly to the porous medium domain at whatever, you know, at whatever kind of depth you, you like. Okay, so I haven't seen any other questions coming in, so we'll, uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. Thanks again, Ryan, very much. Um, now we'll have a presentation by Dr. Rachel Hausko. Rachel received her bachelor's degree in environmental science with highest honors from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Following her graduation, she spent some time working as a postgraduate at the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, where she examined the health and ecological effects of air pollutants. She then completed a PhD in applied ocean science and engineering in the MIT WHOI joint program. Today, Rachel works as a postdoctoral researcher, also in the Michaels uh, Hydrogeology Group at the University of Delaware. And Rachel has actually just recently announced that she'll be joining the Pennsylvania State University's Geoscience Department as an assistant professor in July 2023. So congratulations on that, Rachel. Um, her interest, or her research interests include coastal hydrogeology, groundwater surface water interactions, aquifer salinization, storm impacts, coastal flooding, and more. And today, Rachel will deliver her presentation on the impacts of ocean surge profiles on overwash driven salinization in coastal aquifers. Take it away, Rachel. Okay, well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for that intro, Braden. Um, as Braden mentioned, um, I have some background in oceanography. And so, really, what my work is directed at currently is trying to incorporate more of these ocean side hydrodynamic processes into thinking about how these coastal systems recover after these big scale ocean surge driven flooding events that you can see here on the title slide. 
So here we're looking at a schematic of a coastal aquifer and um, under pre-storm conditions, typically your head is gonna be highest somewhere inland and that's gonna drive a fresh groundwater flow inland out towards the ocean. And then out in the ocean around Mason sea level, you have this sort of classical salt wedge of this high density driven water that's intruding into the aquifer that we've seen both in Ryan and in Air's presentation. And what happens during these big ocean surge, surge events is that the storm surge and the wave setup is going to increase the shoreline wa water levels and this high salinity water is going to inundate the coast. And this drives a vertical saltwater intrusion of this high salinity water up above the fresher groundwater. Um, and post after the storm comes through, the salt is going to start to be flushed by this fresh groundwater from inland. Um, and this is really important to understand because the salinization process is going to threaten the health of the ecohydrological system. There's plants and other organisms that depend on having fresh water on these barriers. And it also really limits the availability of fresh water for drinking, irrigation, and commercial use within these coastal communities. And so I'm really interested in using these hydrogeosphere models to think about these salinization and recovery processes. And there's been a lot of prior work that has looked at this. Um, so Anair, who spoke earlier, has done some work on looking at the role of repetitive surges and sea level rise. There's been studies that have looked at the roles of permeability and recharge in these overwash and salinization processes, as well as um, a study that's integrated some more complex coastal topographies, so dune, crater, riverine systems. But kind of the unifying approach for how this has been studied is all of these studies have incorporated sort of a Gaussian ocean surge profile in when this, these overwash events occur. And it turns out in the natural environment, that's not always the most realistic approach. So here we're looking at uh, two different storms from three different locations across the US East Coast, Boston, Massachusetts, the Battery, New York, and Ocean City, Maryland. And what you can see just by looking at this is these ocean surge profiles actually have a really wide variability in both shape and duration across different events um, at a single location as well as spatially across the East Coast for a single storm. And so here we're looking at, you know, a pretty broad scale of the US East Coast, but that variability can, in ocean surge can also be sort of at the smaller inlet bay system scale. So here we're looking at Delaware Inland Bay. And on the right, we're looking at maximum surge height from uh, Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So this is uh, really a system that's a couple of kilometers in scale. And you can see even in the smaller inlet bay system, you have a couple of meters of variability in where the maximum surge height is. And that could be important in how, where, and these system rec systems recover from these ocean surge overwash events. And so that's really what's motivated my research process project. It's thinking about how does the shape and duration of these ocean surge profiles affect aquifer salinization and recovery? And how does spatial variation in these ocean surge profiles affect the salinization and recovery? And so you've already heard a lot about how we use hydrogeosphere to do this, but they're really the key piece of this for us. It's because it's coupling surface and subsurface modeling. It can do the surface ponding and overwash that's really driving the salinization. So you can see my modeling setup on the right here, where you have the surface domain in the top left and the ocean water line is going to be tracked by that blue. And in the bottom, you see that classical salt wedge where the yellow is high salinity and blue is fresher groundwater. So as the storms come through, the ocean water level comes up and that drives salt into the system. And there's going to be a pretty big time jump at the end of the system as, I, as that salt gets flushed out by that fresher groundwater and the system starts to recover. And so um, my grid is pretty similar to the one that Anair used and using a fairly idealized model with a constant beach slope. Um, and my horizontal and vertical resolution are on 10 to 20 meter scales in horizontal and a meter and a half to about 10 meters in the vertical. And I'm keeping my hydraulic conductivities fairly low. So I'm using a horizontal hydraulic conductivity of about 15 meters per day and a vertical hydraulic conductivity of 1.5 meters per day. And that's done fairly intentionally to keep the Rayleigh number low. And that's something I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later in the presentation. And so I'm applying the model very similarly to how we've seen um, it used already today, where I'm applying a specified flux of freshwater at that inland boundary. And on the ocean side, I'm using a time series of heads to drive that a storm surge driven overwash. And in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about two approaches I'm using to do that. The first, I'm using an idealized simulation where I'm just varying the shape of that and duration of that ocean surge profile. And then in the second piece of this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about 
doing that using surge time series, I'm actually taking out a surface water hydrodynamic model for that Delaware Inland Bay system that we looked at earlier. So here in the top left, we're looking at two ocean surge profiles that I'm applying to the ocean sign boundary condition of my model. The profile in blue is that sort of classical Gaussian storm surge approach that's been used in a lot of prior studies. And then in the orange profile, I'm just extending the duration, so doubling the time that the storm is at the max water level. And I'm pulling out the seven PSU contour for my model, and that's basically tracking the edge of, it's about the 20% salinity contour, and it's tracking the edge of where the salt water is within my model domain. So really just del delineating the boundary of the pool. And this is somewhat arbitrarily defined, but I've tested a few different thresholds, and the results that I'm going to present aren't sensitive to the value that I choose. Um, so here we're looking at that 7 PSU contour taken at the peak of the storm for each of the cases. So blue corresponds to the Gaussian profile and orange corresponds to the longer duration profile. And the solid black line here is the position of that saltwater interface as a function of depth. And so the result here is actually pretty intuitive, right? If you have a storm that comes through and lasts for a longer duration, you get more salt that infiltrates into the aquifer and that plume makes it deeper into the aquifer system. And so if we look at a couple more snapshots from after the storm, so if we look right at the end of the storm, there's still a difference in the aquifer of about two meters between the top, uh, between that Gaussian storm profile and that extended duration storm state. And that actually persists all the way through recovery. So if we look at one year post-storm, that vertical position is actually exaggerated and you now have about a five meter vertical elevation difference in where that plume gets to in the aquifer or how much volume of the aquifer is salinized. And so I was actually able to stand in front of you right now. That's, uh, you know, much taller than me. So like three of me standing, you know, on my shoulders. So really big difference in how deep this, this salt gets for these extended duration cases. And so I wanted to now look at what actually happens if you just change the shape of this profile. Um, so now we have three different cases. Again, that blue where it's Gaussian, the green where it's a uh, right skewed profile. So it's gonna, the ocean water level is going to rise up really quickly and drop off fairly slowly. And in the red, you have the opposite of that. You have a less skewed profile where you're going to the ocean water level is going to come up really slowly but drop drop off relatively quickly. And I wanted to understand how that behavior would actually ultimately end up uh, affecting how the salt was distributed throughout the aquifer system. So and again, we take a snapshot of that plume boundary from each of the, the peaks of each of the storms. You can see that the blue and the red profile um, end up, you know, overlapping each other fairly similar. And the storm that ramps up really quickly stays a little bit shallower in the system. But if we take a snapshot from the end of the storm, that difference sort of erases itself. And all of these plume boundaries end up within about 60 centimeters of each other by the time the storm has um, dropped off. But if we run it out to a year, we start to see um, some variation in where the plume boundary is defined. The green stays fairly shallowest, whereas the Gaussian storm stays deepest in the aquifer system. And the reason I think this is happening is because we're just seeing the boundary. There's actually some variation in uh, where within this plume how the salt is distributed, and that affects how it interacts with this freshwater flushing that's actually pushing the salt out of the system. Um, and so even though this is not a huge effect of the profile shape, there is a little bit. And I think that that can actually be exacerbated and under some different storm conditions. So in as we know that sometimes when these ocean surge events come through, that's coincident with really heavy rainfall. And so that's something I'm interested in building into the study as well. And that could also accentuate the differences between the profile shapes. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is I'm keeping my Rayleigh number fairly low. And so I'm also interested in simulating different both beach slopes and hydraulic parameters because um, under different hydraulic parameters, you might uh, higher Rayleigh numbers, you might expect to see um, this density driven convective salt fingering. And that also might really dramatically affect how these systems uh, recover post storm. So those are sort of the next steps for this project. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm actually going to shift gears a little bit and talk to you a little bit about um, surge time series that I'm actually using to drive this model from a hydrodynamic model of Delaware Inland Bays. We saw Delaware Inland Bays briefly earlier, but it's a fairly shallow bay system 
um, of two bays, Rehoboth Bay to the north and Indian River Bay to the south. And you can see from the scale bar down here, they're about 12 kilometers in length. And these bays are connected to the Atlantic Ocean through the Indian River Inlet, which is this really small channel that I've zoomed in on here. And that actually ends up being really important for how this system responds to storm surges. So I'm taking uh, output from a model near PBD, which is a surface water hydrodynamic model uh, developed by Dr. Feng Yangshi that's able to simulate wave uh, currents and storm surge. And the grid cells in this model have uh, you can see the domain on the right has a resolution of about a kilometer, and the colors here are the bathymetry in the model. And I'm taking storm surge time series from Hurricane uh, Sandy in 2012 and using those time series as boundary conditions to drive my groundwater model. And I'm going to show you two examples of this um, from two sites, the site in the North Rehoboth Bay in Teal and a site in the Delaware Inland, uh, in the Indian River Bay in Pink. And so um, you, these are the time series that come out of the model. So what you might notice is that in the southern bay, the amplitude of the storm surge and the amplitude of the tide is bigger than in the northern um, Indian River Bay. And the reason for this is that that pink site is very directly connected to the inlet, whereas up in Rehoboth Bay, that tide has to route through uh, um, the southern bay up north, bend around into Rehoboth Bay. So you're a little bit sheltered from both the surge and it damps out the amplitude of the tide. And so what impact does this have on how this system uh, might salinize? So I'm using, again, that same idealized 2D model and taking snapshots of that 7 PSU contour. And so now you can see that there's a difference both in how deep the salt gets. Um, it gets deeper, you know, where you have a higher storm surge, and also how far inland the salt makes it um, because of that slight variability in the maximum surge height. The other thing you might notice looking at these contours is that the idealized surge profiles, those plume boundaries were fairly smooth, but now we have sort of a jagged plume boundary, and that's an effect of that tide that's sort of stationing the salt back and forth as the storm ramps up and comes through the system. And you have about a two meter vertical difference in where you actually see the salt across these two cases. Um, but a hundred meter difference in the horizontal. And um, if we run this out post storm, that again, as that salt sort of sinks down into the aquifer, that vertical difference becomes exaggerated. And again, you have this really big five meter vertical difference in where that salt ultimately ends up. Um, so, Next steps for this project are to try and um, take all of these coastal surge profiles from this model for Hurricane Sandy and be, uh, run that through these tidal geosphere models and come up with some sort of metric for salinization risk for the inland bays. And then we want to be able to do that for a bunch of different storm cases to figure out what storm conditions generate the highest risk for the system. Um, and then the last step is uh, Dr. Fenyan Chi has uh, taken his one kilometer grid down to about a three meter resolution. And the real advantage of that is now you can see all of these channels and tributaries throughout the system. And that might have an impact not only on where and how the aquifer is salinized, but also just in terms of understanding the physics that drives the groundwater flow through these systems. So being able to integrate these higher resolution models into some of this groundwater modeling analysis might actually um, really help us in understanding how the, these systems work. Um, so to wrap up, um, so far it looks like longer ocean surge durations will increase um, the vertical extent of these salt plumes. Um, so far, profile shape uh, of the ocean surge profile has had a lesser influence uh, on salinization and recovery, but that might change um, under different hydraulic parameter conditions as well as different recharge scenarios. Um, and then overall, I think there's a lot of benefits to thinking through how we link groundwater and surface water models to think through both, you know, salinization and other process processes such as groundwater flow, transport, and coastal flooding. Um, so thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, we'll take a moment to see if any questions come in. Doesn't look like it. Oh, actually, here we go. One question again from Britt. Um, Britt asks, do you assume spatially uniform inland aquifer heads around the bay? For example, different uh, surge levels, but constant aquifer heads. Any idea whether there are spatial variations in pre-surge 
heads? Yeah, that's a great question, Britt. So for right now, I am assuming that the inland head is going to be the same everywhere. Um, so one thing that I think I am going to change about how I'm setting this up is I'm going to delineate my barrier island cells from my inland cells when I'm doing the colonization risk analysis. But yeah, I think that's another thing, um, a, a spatial component that I'm not getting from the way I'm doing this analysis at the moment. Any other questions? Okay, if there are other questions that we can get to them after our last presentation. So thanks again, Rachel. Um, last but not least, we've got a presentation now by Katie Falk. Katie is a PhD student in the Department of Land Resources and Environmental Studies at Montana State University, where she also received her master's degree, if I'm not mistaken. Katie uh, researches heat exchange and temperature cycles in floodplain streams. Specifically, she's investigating how hyperreic exchange and vegetative shading affect channel temperatures and how heat exchanges across floodplain sediments have the potential to be exploited in restoration and management practices to drive cooler or warmer hyperreic and stream channel temperatures. So we'll be shifting gears a bit here from saltwater intrusion studies to thermal energy transport. Feel free to steal the screen and take it away, Katie. Thanks, Brayden. Alrighty. So today I'll be talking about the effects of floodplain shading on hyperic aquifer temperatures and the implications for restoration. This research was primarily funded by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, with additional support from the Montana Agricultural Experiment Station, the Montana Institute on Ecosystems, and the Montana Water Center. Hyperic exchange is the bidirectional exchange of water between the stream channel and its underlying sediments. This image from Pool et al. 2008 shows the diversity of flow path lengths differentiated by color and the lateral expansiveness of the hyperic zone of the Umatilla River, which is a gravel bedded floodplain river. Pool 2008 also shows that as hyperic flow path length increases, the annual temperature signal is damped and lagged compared to the stream channel temperature, as seen in the blue and purple lines representing temperatures across the year at 175 and 955 meter hyperic flow paths compared to the black line, which is the stream channel temperature. This graph shows just the annual time scale, but a similar pattern of a damped and lagged temperature with increasing flow path length is seen at the daily time scale as well. In the summer months, upwelling hyperic water is often cooler than the stream channel, thus mediating the effects of hot summertime channel temperatures, providing patches of cool water refugia. However, the degradation of hyperic zones reduces the effectiveness of hyperic exchange to mitigate channel temperatures. Reduced hyperic exchange can be a result of a multitude of human alterations, including channelization, land use changes, and the construction of dams, which lead to the disconnection of the hyperic zone with the channel. Hyperic restoration can return ecological functioning back to a stream reach, including restored temperature regulation via increased hyperic exchange. So today I'll be talking about a specific hyperic restoration which took place on this section of Meacham Creek. Meacham Creek is located in the Blue Mountains east of Pendleton, Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. This stream flows south to north into the Umatilla River, which flows west before its confluence with the Columbia River. In the early 1900s, Union Pacific built a rail line along the Eastern Valley Wall of Meacham Canyon and later dredged the channel against the Western Valley Wall as a preventative measure against flood damage. This disconnected Meacham Creek from its historic floodplain and reduced hyperic exchange. This dredged reach warmed by approximately one degree Celsius in 1.6 kilometers as seen in this graph showing mean summertime temperatures for a few years pre-restoration where upstream temperatures are shown in orange and downstream temperatures are shown in green. A primary restoration goal was to reduce this downstream warming by increasing hyperic exchange. 
So the restoration took place um, in 2011, as shown in this middle Google Earth image. And in July of that year, Meacham Creek began to flow through its newly constructed channel, and we saw an immediate increase in the groundwater level and a well in the historic alluvial aquifer. Hydrologic modeling of the Meacham Creek floodplain pre and post restoration, which was done by my colleague Byron Emerson in hydrogeosphere, shows a change in the residence time distribution of hyperiac water. This graph shows a cumulative mean residence time distribution for each month of the year. Pre restoration, shown as dashed lines, there was a greater proportion of longer hyperiac residence times than post restoration, where there is a greater proportion of shorter residence times. This indicates that the restored floodplain has higher gross exchange rates than pre-restoration. So along with this increase in hyperic exchange rate, we expected to see increased thermal regulation in this reach. However, post-restoration, we actually saw an increase in longitudinal warming of the restoration reach instead of a decrease. Pre-restoration, we measured approximately one degree of longitudinal warming across the 1.6 kilometer reach, and post-restoration, we measured about two degrees. So this had us pretty stumped because we fully expected the increase in hyperic exchange to reduce downstream warming. Looking across these aerial images of the restoration reach, pre and post-restoration, we see that it is apparent that the floodplain forest was greatly reduced during the restoration. This was necessary in order to get heavy machinery into the floodplain to create the new channel. So this led us to hypothesize that the reduced shade on the broader floodplain post restoration caused greater heat conduction through the unsaturated beta zone, which warmed hyperic zone temperatures, which in turn warmed the stream channel via upwelling hyperic water. Thus, a sunny floodplain will reduce the temperature mitigating capacity of hyperic exchange compared to a shady floodplain with an intact riparian forest. To test our hypothesis, we set up a simple simulation experiment in hydrogeosphere, where we simulated the restored channel with shade patterns on the floodplain surface representative, representative of either pre-restoration shade or post-restoration shade. Across both simulations, we kept the channel in full sun in order to, to differentiate channel warming due to increased solar radiation directly on the channel surface from channel warming via increased hyperate zone temperatures due to less shade on the broader floodplain. So we simulated an area of the floodplain approximately 900 meters upstream to approximately 600 meters downstream of this restoration reach, and we used LIDAR bare earth elevations as the surface elevation of our simulated floodplain. And then we constructed an alluvial hyperate zone, which was 2.5 meters thick, and a bedrock layer below that, which was 25 meters thick. We used steady state hydrology representative of base flow conditions on Meacham Creek. The upstream channel flux boundary was approximately 0.3 meters per second, or around 9 CFS. The Darcy flux boundary of the hyperig zone was 4 meters per day on the upstream edge. And we used a specified head boundary to allow surface and subsurface water to freely flow out of the model on the downstream end. The east, west, and bottom sides of the model were no flow boundaries. So next we created tree height rasters pre and post restoration by subtracting the highest hits LIDAR data from the bare earth elevations. And then I converted those rasters into these binary rasters where we assigned the yellow cells a solar radiation time series representing clear sky radiation and assigned the black cells a solar radiation time series representing full shade. And here are those time series. So I, I retrieved solar radiation data for, me, for Meacham Creek from the NASA SEERS project, which stands for the Clouds and the Earth's Radiant Energy Systems, and I retrieved this full sun um, data shown on the top. Um, I reduced this full sun time series using a calibration curve, 
where I made a simple linear regression in R of measured solar radiation from a shady site on Meacham Creek against the solar radiation from a sunny site on Meacham Creek. I used compound sine wave models of measured air and water temperature on Meacham Creek for the model's atmosphere and inflowing stream channel temperature. I held wind speed relative humidity and air pressure constant throughout my model runs. So I spun up the pre and post restoration shade models for four years and then cropped the output data and analyzed just the 1.6 kilometer restoration reach. Additionally, I subset the model output into three zones, the floodplain surface, the hyper rig zone surface, and the stream channel. Here I'm showing temperature maps of all three zones pre and post restoration. Note that today I'll only be showing temperature data for a single point in time, um, August 14th at noon. So first off, comparing the floodplain surfaces, we can see that the surface temperature directly corresponds to the shade pattern pre and post restoration. Now, when we compare the hyperreg zone temperatures, we can see that these patches of warmer temperatures post restoration. And if we zoom in on that downstream patch, we can see that this area of warmer hyperreg water corresponds with this area of the floodplain surface where a lot of vegetation was removed. So this panel here shows where the vegetation was removed and down here we can see that the water is much warmer compared to pre-restoration. Looking at histograms of the temperatures in that specific area of the floodplain, we can see that there's a decrease in the frequency of cool floodplain surface temperatures and an increase in warm temperatures post restoration. And although perhaps it's more of a subtle shift, we also see a decrease in the frequency of cool temperatures and an increase in warmer temperatures in the hyperreg zone after the restoration. Now looking at stream channel temperature maps on this section of the floodplain, the post-restoration stream has patches of warmer water pretty visible in, um, in certain areas of the stream reach. And note that I changed the range of the temperature map to better display the patchiness of stream channel temperatures here. Now comparing the temperature frequencies seen on one graph here, we see a shift to greater frequency of warmer temperatures after the restoration. And this has really important implications for the amount of thermal refugia available to sensitive, um, thermally sensitive salmonid species, which are common to Meacham Creek. Now looking at our original metric of longitudinal warming of the channel across the restoration reach, we, used to be, we see about a half a degree more warming in the post-restoration less shade model. Since everything else was held constant across model scenarios except the amount of floodplain shade, we have pretty good evidence that the warming of the hyperreg zone and the stream channel was due to this reduction in floodplain shade after the restoration. So in conclusion, in alluvial rivers with hyperreg zones that are laterally expansive, consideration of floodplain shade management both during and after restoration actions may improve outcomes for restoration of stream channel temperatures. And with that, I would love to answer any questions that anyone might have. I see actually, yeah, one question came in. Um, so from, from Britt, uh, Britt asks, Katie, are they doing any vegetation restoration now? Um, they are not. They, I don't think that they've done any planting. Um, but so that, you know, this whole, my whole research has been, it's a little bit dated. You know, a lot of that warming was measured, um, you know, 20, around 2014 and those around those years. Now that it's 2022, um, I haven't been back to Meacham Creek in a couple years, but the last time I was there, there's a lot of new willow growth. So, um, and just, you know, with, with time, I think that it will recover. Maybe not the forest on the broader floodplain, um, but definitely like uh, there's a lot more vegetation 
in the gravel bars and along the banks than there used to be. So I think it'll improve with time. Another question from Rachel. Um, she asks, do you know if the restoration changed anything about the sediment structure that would change infiltration or runoff dynamics? Um, you know, I don't really know if they did much with sediment structure. I know that, so it was channelized before, so there was less um, infiltration into the hyper, into that alluvial aquifer before the restoration. And now that, that that river is flowing in the middle of its floodplain, there's a lot more areas where um, water could downwell into the alluvial aquifer than before. Um, but I'm, I don't think that, I'm not sure about runoff dynamics. I don't believe so. Um, this part of the country has uh, rain on snow events. So it's, um, the hydrograph is pretty extreme. It goes from like, you know, nine CFS base load to like 10,000 in the spring, um, which just changes the channel, um, really pushes a lot of water into the aquifer and um, there's a lot of hyperic exchange in this area. I'm not sure if I answered your question actually, but. She says awesome, thanks. So that's okay. a yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, Bayred here at Aquanti asks, will there be a far future scenario in which vegetation has been reestablished? He suggests that would be a cool, cool scenario. Yeah. Model. Yeah. So I've, I've been thinking about so like, um, seeing other parts of the floodplain that weren't restored and sort of taking a, um, a, like, a seeing, like, if I could attribute, like, the shade dynamics that are happening in other parts of the floodplain to this part of the floodplain, um, but, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe that would be a good idea. I wonder if we have LIDAR flights for, for recently, but I don't know about far future. Well, thank you again very much, Katie, for your presentation. It was very interesting. It's the one presentation yeah. I missed at ModFlow and more, so I was really yeah. happy to, to <laughs> get you, you guys to see it. <laughs> um, I think if we have the time, we'll just circle back very quickly to Anair because there were two questions that came in after Anair's presentation that we didn't get to. Um, so Gban had asked Anair, did you include anisotropy in your model? Yeah, so I did not include anisotropy. The K was a the tropic throughout the model domain, throughout the simulations. I do have other simulations for different projects that um, have anisotropy. And for the salinization dynamics, there are differences, I will say that. But in this project, as I said, everything was as tropic. Perfect. And then there was one last question from Yaming, who asked, did you consider applied, uh, an applied increased recharge on the land surface due to sea level rise? And again, this was a question for Anair. Yeah, so I think Ryan touched a little bit on that on, on his uh, Q&A session. It, it's, it is perhaps reasonable to increase or to vary recharge, especially considering storm conditions. Uh, but for this simulation, since we wanted to, you know, isolate the impact of the sea level fluctuations, um, we did not vary recharge. We wanted to keep the average hydraulic gradient, land to sea hydraulic gradient, or land to initial sea, um, somewhat constant, so we, we did not, and again, that's, that was intentional to keep our focus on the sea level fluctuations. Perfect. Okay, well, I thank our presenters one last time. Thank you very much for your time. It was great to, to get an opportunity to hear about your research. Um, Anybody who, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to contact me. If, you know, I can put you in touch with the authors, of course, or the presenters. Um, but yeah, thank you one last time. That brings us to the end of the webinar. So I'll stop the recording now, and uh, we can all enjoy the rest of our afternoons. Thanks again, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>